Hey everyone, welcome to another AI conversation. I'm joined today by Gerald uh, Velarde, uh, who uh, I actually met just via LinkedIn. Uh, we hit it off immediately in the DMs. Uh, he's uh, uh, Gerald, you're currently taking uh, a course at the AIM and also running a startup. So I'd love to hear about that. But first, maybe a brief introduction yeah, sure. to the audience uh, about yourself and your background. Sure thing. Um... Doc, thank you for connecting and thank you for the invite. So just a quick introduction of who I am. Um, I'm a founder and entrepreneur. Um, it's how I built my career to transitioning from a construction industry to like the tech space, to product management, entrepreneurship, and startups. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my proudest work is actually around the nonprofit sector. It's called Datos Pilipinas, where we okay. aim to solve Filipino problems with the power of AI, data, and technology. Um, there's it, that's a tangent we can dive deep into later on, but just to tell you my goals as a person, and I think this would be a great introduction of who who I am as a person. It's I'm spending the next twenty years figuring out what does it take to actually build a unicorn startup, and I'm designing my education, my career, and my decisions around my life around that north star. Um, 20 years is quite a bit of a long time, but it's something that I, I just picked up arbitrarily so that, you know, you have a mission in your life and like, oh, go towards at least a single direction. And then, yeah, um, I hope that paints a picture of who Gerald is. <laughs> nice. Very exciting. No? And when you say unicorn, does that mean like a billion dollar valuation? Is that, is that what you mean? Yeah, by, by it, it's very arbitrary. Uh, the unicorn status and the billion dollar dollars. Uh, valuation of a company but it's what got me uh, to fall in love with technology imagine building something somewhere rural in the Philippines scaling that up all over the world and solving someone's problem across the world in America or in Europe that's like magic to me and that's what got me in this so yeah <laughs> yeah which, okay uh, welcome to the yeah. show and yeah if <laughs> You're talking about unicorn startups. Oh yeah, we can talk endlessly about that. No, but sige, let's let's kick it off. So, um, sure so how has your journey been so far? So you mentioned you worked in a nonprofit. So we kind of have an intersection there. Uh, we spent the better part of the pandemic uh, <laughs> doing humanitarian work, uh, but using data also. So we worked with the likes of WHO, UNICEF, uh, mostly COVID related. Um, so in your case, what what was your let's start with that and then then talk about how you slid into from nonprofit land. Now you're chasing the unicorn dream, basically. You know? How 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 was that yeah. for you? How did you start? So to clarify, I'm not yet chasing the unicorn dream. I'm just learning about the industry and uh moving towards that. But yes, that's a North Star. Um, how I got into the nonprofit and we how we started that as Filipinas, it's basically solving our own problems. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a big fan of YC and the educational content they put out something I think a lot of institutions should do as well uh, shout out to like, organizations in the Philippines for that one but um, basically last in 2022 we had a major election in the Philippines I'm sure you and uh, a lot of the listeners might know and for some of us it was the first time actually voting and experiencing the electoral process mm -hmm. and then we realized that hey how can we actually get closer to the objective group politics seems like a huge um gap and like gap between uh the actual truth and the, between sensationalism and data so right. what we figured out once we talked to like the people in the space so I personally practice product management there. I talk to like different stakeholders and experts. I talk to Comelec regional directors, Dole, um, sorry, not Dole, Comelec regional uh, directors in in our area. I talk to uh, DILG people in the government, like elected politicians and those who are actually campaigning. And most importantly, the people who are going to vote. So we try to learn about the problem. And then we realized that there are a few key problems that are unaddressed in the space. Like mm -hmm. people will only get to know about 
candidate through political advertising. So it's basically the only way you'll get to know about the candidate is um I- I'm not talking about just the presidential election, right? So um from the president down to our barangay level officials, we are talking about 50,000 candidates, around 50,000 candidates, and 18,000 of them in the Philippines will right. take uh take seat all over the Philippines. And who are these people? Who's keeping track? Uh, where's their LinkedIn profile, <laughs> basically? And uh, so that's like the, the angle of the problem that we aim to solve. We saw this as a data problem, and we built Veripol around that. And a lot of people, especially the young generation, uh, the next generation of tech professionals, are actually very passionate around the mission. So we did a volunteer drive. We grew the team from a small team of five to a team of 30 with mm. varying levels of, of uh, experience and uh, industries. So we got data engineers at one side, political analysts and other economists, uh, economics students and uh, statistics students all over uh, the team. And basically we tried our best to solve the problem and we built Veripol and grew that into Datas Filipinas. So um, yeah, that's how I get got into this space, into the nonprofit space, and then um, we continue to build Datas Pilipinas with a 30 year vision. <laughs> so wait, can I clarify that your sure. mission was to build data for politics, tama ba? You wanted. Thanks to for start. asking. Yeah. So the the North Star here, uh, the main vision here is we want to make it easier for people to make smarter decisions. Right. So easy. That it would be the default because right now it's so difficult. Imagine you have to search for individual candidates from top to bottom, from presidents to um, barangay officials, and there's no source of truth. There. Uh, yeah. No single source of truth. So I would it. argue some of them may like it that way. You know that they're <laughs> really ambiguous about their backgrounds and their track records. So yeah. this, is this like just basically starting with the LinkedIn for politics, parang ganon, and then later. I- building was other a, things yeah yeah so that was the initial idea but as you might know it's not the best way to solve a problem to approach it with a solution mm, mm. <laughs> so we did our best to learn about the problem root ourselves in it talk to the people experiencing it talk to our target users and then we define the problem so it started from something like that uh linkedin for politicians and it evolved into um a mobile app that gathers data Uh, from, mobile app, hmm. yeah. Mobile app gathers data from our Comelec, the publicly available data, hmm. uh, from our Senate database, from our, our DTI competitive index. So yeah. there's this competitive index as well, and just collating and making sense of it. And yeah, that's that's. How, did third. you did you come to any, parang final ano? form for that political database or is it still in progress? How 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 was the build of that? Uh, thanks for asking. So it was a very difficult uh project to solve in under two months from okay. ideation to delivery. Why, why two months? Because you were yeah. doing it before the elections. You wanted to get yeah, it just months. before ah, the election. Okay, got it. <laughs> ah. Yeah. So we had to launch before the election day and get uh get that to as many hands as we can get it to. Did you And, did you continue after the elections? Yeah, so right now the vision for Veripol and Datos Pilipinas, we're looking at this as a long term project. Mm-hmm. Think about we've just started this like uh, in 2022. What if we spend 30 years working on this, continually improving on this as we grow our careers? We're yeah. not only going to build the infrastructure. We're also gathering the data as we grow with higher levels of quality and quantity. So that being said, uh, it's also a great way to learn. <laughs> Which yeah, have- certainly. Yeah, it's an an ambitious uh, project. I, I I'm only curious because there is a really a a gap in terms of uh, educating voters, and there's even this thing called uh, like uh, political memory. It's very short term. I yeah, think, yeah. I think we need to improve that. It doesn't help that our Political parties are a dime a dozen, and even they yeah. don't maintain, parang profiles, no? Of yeah, who yeah. they carry, so it makes sense that it it starts as a as a citizens' initiative, or even better, well, actually depends. Uh, it it should also be kind of a government requirement. Like if you're Comelec, you should be maintaining this for access. The reality is, 
I don't know if you encountered this. If you go to Comelec to get kunyari yung mga certificates of candidacy, mga COC nila, mm -hmm. you have to pay. <laughs> you have to pay to get that data. And it's not open data. Mm -hmm. And and as you said, 50,000 candidates, that's a big stack of uh, papers. Uh, and then it's not in digital format. You have to get it as uh, hard copies. Mahirap, no? And yeah, we had to mine it from PDFs. <laughs> like, do the data processor from it. What's very, very dirty. Mm. <laughs> the engineer, my lead data engineer was like, uh, stressing out on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I would be, syempre, I'm not, you know, pressuring anything, but it would be nice to to keep that project alive, no? So I don't know, before we move on to other aspects of your background, how do we, how do we connect with that database and how do we make sure that Absolutely. it continues to, uh, to, yeah. uh, to thrive? Yeah, so this is more of a volunteer experience for all of us. And uh, the great thing here is the core founding team is aligned with the vision. Mm. And it's a long-term project. Our goal is to launch this 2024 and make it open source. So it's mm. not just limited by us. It's, it's crowdsourced. It, it's built by the people for the people. Mm. And um, actually, while we're on the topic, the long vision here is if we are successful, despite how difficult this challenge is, we hope to become a template that might become a way to reimagine modern democracy. Because democracy as a concept is very old. And now we have to like have a way to keep up with technology and the times nowadays. Yeah, and it's ironic. Siyempre, segue tayo ng konti. <laughs> Uh, some technologies are proving to be corrosive or dangerous to democracy. Absolutely. Which is, uh, yeah, it's really ironic. Because democracy, in a way, helped usher in the Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. And then now, you have technologies that are attacking democracy and we're, uh, in many cases, uh, parang reverting back to some old you know, old models. No? Yeah, yeah. And, and that's very unfortunate. And I wish if um, people can take anything from that as Filipinas in our work here is that if you are capable of doing something uh, for our society and you have some free time, please do it and like make it part of your portfolio and try to make as big of an impact as you can. Um, none of us are working on this full time as of the moment, but it's it's more of our societal contribution to yeah, as as we make an impact and it also helps us. Uh, our portfolio as well. And actually, that's how I pitched it to uh, the volunteers <laughs> when we were gathering it. Yeah. yeah. Well, so, sorry to dwell on it. Just one sure. more. No? So go, usually go, go. when these political apps or solutions come up, they may be inadvertently linked to some partisan group. So in, in your case, are you officially linked to any party or side or anything? Or if not... Uh, how do you stay uh, kind of non-partisan? No? So does Datos Pilipinas work on behalf of anyone? That's a very interesting question. And we had to face that problem during the last election. We made a couple of mistakes and we were learning from it. But our goal is to approach this as a technological perspective with mm -hmm. bringing tech into like governance. And one of the key problems that you actually touched up on is like when candidates run and like file their COCs, uh, certificate of candidacy, they paid Comelec. And Comelec gives them data about the voters. Yeah. I talked to like the regional director about this. And when I asked as a voter, can I get a copy of the data? They just said no. Like, what's going on? Like, hey, this is our data. And why mm -hmm. is it not available to us, but available to the candidates? And then what's our version of this? And that's like fueled our passion for Ver Veripol. It's like our counter to that is our data with our candidates. <laughs> And that's that, hard. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it is. Yeah, and uh, I would say by even stating that wish, that passion out loud, scared a couple of my developers. Like, hey, we're not gonna die because of this, right? <laughs> and that's uh, hard. You know, in many ways, speaking from experience, um, because mm -hmm. I have had a few, parang like for example, I'm in a way I'm an adopted member of the journalist community. I I, I was yeah. invited to join the Philippine Center for Investigative Journalism. So by default, in theory, journalists should be nonpartisan, right? Yeah. You have yeah. to report the truth. You know, the most abused word these days, the truth. But if you're in an environment where 
the prevailing admin, talking about previous admin, uh, was corrosive to journalism. Journalists were getting red tagged, were getting killed, um, and media companies are being shut down. How do you avoid being part and uh, being partisan at the very least? No? You, there, there's a concept ngon na sa eh, the uh, ano ba yun? the paradox of tolerance. I don't know if you've heard of that. No? I got reminded of that many times uh, because if you tolerance as a good concept, pero the more you tolerate, you can end up tolerating you know individuals or entities that could then be corrosive to tolerance, no. And for example, uh, like give you a specific one. And sorry to detract from the sure, chat. Sure, go, um, go, go. Remember, there was a time when uh, people like Simoka Uson, no, who was very pro admin, was getting mobbed and mass reported because she was basically spreading some disinformation. So I had I felt uncomfortable about the idea of mass reporting someone. It's like you're weaponizing social media. But in a way, people kind of give it a pass because eh, si Moka lang naman yan eh. <laughs> the same manner it's happening now, no? Uh, there's a threat to shut down uh, SMNI, which is a media company. And God knows that 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 company has been guilty of a lot of things, uh, you know, in terms of journalistic ethics. But then the way it's being shut down basically is a be is 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 a weaponized form of lawfare, no? Like Congress is locked. And just because SMNI is critical of the current admin, ironically, uh, now they're on the verge of being shut down. So, you know, parang at some point, you can't dabble in political parang political structures, political tech, and be completely agnostic. At some point, you will end up leaning one or the other. And that's what I think kept the development of things like itong very poll app nyo, yung Datos Pilipinas, which I, I believe should be supported. But how do you find support and stay non-partisan, di ba? Parang in theory, dapat both sides, many sides should support it, agnostically, di ba? Pero if they see na, hey, look, by exposing more information about candidates, it is actually quite bad for our candidate. Ni namin support tahan yan. So uh, that's the problem, eh. And then you're left with private sector, private interests. And uh, that's what's led to Rappler's near demise no? in the last admin the fact that they took money from uh, an Umid the Omidyar group then that's considered interference no, in media and then most recently the shutdown of CNN because of Philippines because well it was not financially viable Dow, which is a surprise for me so the owner of the CNN franchise dito yung basically the people behind RPN9 decided to let go of it no and then now everyone's complaining na uh, I posted about this recently. The entire digital assets of CNN Philippines are gone. No, The websites are gone. Social media is gone. The YouTubes are gone. And that consists of the public record. No, Parang I feel shocked na ah, pwede pala yun. Like a uh, commercial interest can deprive people of a public network. And CNN is probably, of course, depending who you ask, pro they're probably one of the more neutral uh, networks, diba? And to give you objective news, suddenly that's gone. Why? Because it was not financially viable. And never mind why the part where I'm also wondering, how can you be CNN and not be profitable? So if you ask me, then there's probably some measure of mismanagement there. What, like, like you can't attract advertising as CNN Philippines, diba? Parang something's wrong with that picture. No? Or maybe the, the economics of running a media company have changed. Yeah, it still boggles the mind. Anyway, that's a uh, kind of a yeah, digression. Yeah. But anyway, the, back to the point. Um, sana no, your group thrives and continues that project. Was certainly we need it as a country. Yeah, yeah. And before we wrap it up, I just wanna in this particular topic, I just wanna say that what you've raised is actually a very difficult topic. And hmm. yes, it's something that we have and are facing and will face as we build something for. Like governments. Um, the way that we're looking at this is actually we, we just want to focus on the tech side, at least for now. Yeah. Because that in and of itself is a big challenge. Like All right. if take yeah. a look a lot. Yeah, if you take a look at generative AI, it's uh the recent advances, which would be a great uh, segue to our next topic if uh uh we, we want to go into that direction. It's 
in I listened to your talk with Stephen. They're trying to um they're focusing on the the use of GPT and large language models in the enterprise case. Mm-hmm. And what's happening there is they found that it's great at demos, but it sucks in production. <laughs> to actually launch it into production, it it it's unreliable, it's hallucinating, and it's just it just spits out misinformation. Now that could be a flaw, but that could also be a major feature. If you mm. take a look at those flaws in a malicious use case, um, they would actually shine. You want when you want to spread misinformation about a candidate, when you want to spread um, false or just plain targeted uh, information, just to uh, attack a pub- the public's opinion on a on a topic. And they mm. did a study on this. Uh, in TikTok, even though you know that it's blatantly false, if you're exposed to it, it alters your perception. So, yeah. and that's a big of enough. That's a big enough challenge for us to work on. And uh, we want to we want to focus on uh, these issues so far, uh, at least in the next future. Yeah, I mean, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so the, let's now jump to current events, no? Uh, yeah. And I'd like yeah. to hear about your journey then in that respect. So, yeah, the whole idea of putting chatbots in production, I'm all for it, certainly. Um, but I think people are learning how hard it actually is. Parang in yes. in concept, it makes sense, but executing it is harder only because uh, you can't get out of that conversational interface even if you build itong mga rag uh, and fine yeah, 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 it's still essentially a conversation with the mm-hmm. chatbot and I remember see Greg Brockman yata or someone from OpenAI saying yeah. um, can't remember exactly but parang sinabi niya hallucination is not a bug it's a feature it's essentially all that the chatbots do they create they conjure up you know images or text based on yung mga learned patterns. So if you think about it, it's all hallucinations. Nagkakataon lang, in many cases, whatever um. it spouts uh, <laughs> yeah. aligns with your expectation. Yeah. Yeah. So the only time people feel it's a really a hallucination is if, so, if something is off the kind of the, yeah. Yeah. your expectations of the beaten tracker, it's actually false. You yeah. know, incidentally, it's also related to election or um, political disinformation. You know, you'll say it's fake news if you don't agree with it. <laughs> Doesn't necessarily mean it's true or false. So may, in a way, there's a there's a tangent there that's that's uh, that's similar. But for example, okay, let's go back to you. So mm-hmm. uh, that was previously, and then now you're running a startup. Um, what was the the shift, if ever, no, in your in your, I guess your your mental mental mode? No, what made you? decide to embark on this and in especially generative AI no what was your instinct there because chat GPT mm-hmm. came out pretty much the year of the election no? came out latter part of 2022 uh so it was kind of a new thing no one was thinking about gen AI going into the elections and then now suddenly oh, okay. na, no? so yeah, how, how yeah. did that work out for you a great question uh doc yung when we were building Datas Pilipinas and Veripol, we wanted to stay away from qualitative data mm-hmm. for just because of the reason it's too difficult to build, to build with, to analyze, and to launch at scale. And the way we were approaching the problem is that we, for executive candidates, uh, like those who are running in positions like uh, the mayor, governor, mm-hmm. we took data from DTI the competitive index of their area and we're gathering the information before, during, and after their term. There are a lot of factors that could build up on that, but hopefully the, av- the average would cancel out those parameters. Um, and then uh, for legislative candidates, those who are congressmen, senators, and our representatives, um, we gathered data from the legislative, uh, sorry, from the Senate, basically their database. And then yeah. We just presented it. Hey, this candidate wrote like X amount of papers around this topic. And uh, that's the best we could do with the limited amount of time. And this was before generative AI. So the way that we're looking at this now, qualitative data is now a, a lot easier to work with. Mm-hmm. And that's been a major topic from my other talks at Google events from we thought 
Davao, Cebu, and Butuan recently. Um, and that right, be- so you mean you used to avoid qualitative data and yes, now you're embracing yes. it. Okay, got it. Yeah, yeah. And, and now the way that we see an application of generative AI here is that similar to how we use it on a day-to-day basis, it helps us understand. And I think that's the best use case of it. It's like a person you can talk to, but it's not quite uh it's not quite hu- human. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it it doesn't complain when you ask it to summarize, rephrase look at it at a different angle, look at the pros and cons, analyze it from different perspectives and, and whatnot. Uh, as you mentioned, these might be all hallucinations. So what I'm seeing in the future is we're, we now need to look at generative AI specifically around the similar use cases like ChatGPT, uh, ChatGPT's use case as consultants. Mm. So basically we're consulting them, but it's up to us to do the due diligence try to understand their logic and then use whatever we find useful for from what they just hallucinated basically yeah yeah actually uh, and i i do this cuz i i i've started giving uh public webinars no uh yeah, in yeah. in generative ai that's one of the misconceptions that i break at the start that you mm-hmm. that ai needs to be quantitative that it mm-hmm. needs to be mathematical i mean it's built on math <laughs> But Gen AI, it math is probably the worst place to use it. <laughs> so if you read all of these uh, articles about oh, ChatGPT is dumb, you know, you notice it's always a math problem. Yes. You know? Like Anna yeah. has three apples. Tom gets one of them. How many apples does Anna have left? And then nalilito siya. And I'm saying yeah. these are language models. You use it for language problems. Don't use it for math problems. Use Excel for the math problems. Yes. And yes. and it's interesting because you want to convert mathematics into a natural language problem. I feel that there is a problem with that in the way these problems are formulated as a language problem. But anyway, to digress. Um, yeah. yun eh, parang you should use it for qualitative stuff. You should yes. use it for copywriting, for summarizing documents for extrapolating for brainstorming and that also extends to the e- the area of uh, no uh, image generation tools it's all about art describing art understanding art getting emotional with art uh, a lot of it is actually a lot of it is really in the prompting eh? and yeah and, yeah and it's funny uh, because i also teach prompt engineering uh, in the in the one year that you know i've been noisy about ai i have not seen a decent prompt engineering, you know, uh, uh, post about prompt engineering. Now, either A, people know exactly how to do it, but they're not sharing it, or B, they don't know what to do with it. And even if you read all of the scientific literature, the papers, which I use actually as the sources for some of the prompts, uh-huh. they don't capture what it is. I think some of the more simpler things, they kind of get it, like zero-shot prompting versus chain-of-thought prompting. Okay, yun. I think that's the yeah, base yeah, yeah. skeleton. But what you put in a prompt, a lot of it depends on also of whatever mental framework you're using. Absolutely. And, you know. Yeah. Kaya ganun eh. Um and I, and no one writes about that. So sabi ko, okay, if no one's writing about it, I'm going to I'm going to take a stab that no one knows actually. Mainstream, ah, mainstream doesn't know how to do it. And I'll provide that as a training. So that's where <laughs> I'm coming from. And that's why it's funny enough, no. Um when I started advertising yeah, new prompt engineering course ko. My immediate audience kasi are usually mga AI and data practitioners. The traction mm-hmm. was actually very low. As in parang oh si doc uh baka feeling ko nga baka they think I'm selling out na and starting to monetize no. And for me, I'm not selling out, but certainly I want people to pay for my time. I'm not giving that for free. But yeah. I feel also that they don't know exactly what I'm teaching. Akala lang nila I'm going to teach people how to search on Google. Far from it. No? And uh, that's also what's plaguing these RAG implementations. When I meet some of them, they struggle. Because RAG, if anything, is just prompt engineering but in an architecture. No, You build the prompt based yeah. on... A bit more technical. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah but the output of a, a vector search. And even the vector search itself, when I got into it, 
is not a perfect science. No, it's not like chunking every 1,000 characters. Nope, that's actually the worst way to do it. You need to have some contextual way of dividing a data set. I'm sure you count. I love this that. Problem. Yeah. Oh, and you know what's the hardest thing about that vector search? When you try to do quantitative data, like a table, how do you chunk a table by row, by column, you know, by similarity? Yeah, yeah. Walk if you can't get it right. Because if the query is, give me the trend of our sales in the past five years and tell me which channels need to improve, would a vector search know what that means? <laughs> Para it's going to be very hard, no? Unless yeah, you yeah. hard code it. Like, okay, pag sales, five years, ito talaga yung data set, and then the chatbot would know. Anyway, so to, to just to wrap that up, I feel that that's also a big parang, parang ano, blind spot that yeah, yeah. Uh, tech people have, AI people for, for that matter, because they try to be very, I don't know, unnecessarily structured and quantitative about it. But the point of this large language model and this hallucination mechanic is it should be unstructured. It be, yeah. it works best on unstructured information. No? So I don't know. Is that is does that correlate with your experience, or do you have a different view? How how have you guys approached that problem? So I have a couple points here. So I've been talking to founders and people in the industry, writers who have stigma around uh the use of generative AI, even mm. artists who hate it outright. And um, I have a couple points just to touch on to what you've said. Um, I'm gonna start with like model selection and in terms of solution selection in, in general so if you're using generative ai to solve quantitative problems you're using a hammer to write uh you're using a hammer to write an essay basically so uh that might be a poor analogy but there are better tools out there that are still in the realm of ai like supervised learning or the other broad areas of ai that would be better fit for whatever problem you're trying to solve, specifically around predictive analytics and whatnot. I'm sure you, your experience would be uh, would shine more light on this, mat on this matter around using AI for qualitative and predictive experience. If you use generative AI for that, you're using the wrong tool, basically. Mm. Um, and one of the best ways to use AI from my experience, it's actually what you've said, it, it drives in the chaos. And yeah, yeah. People don't exactly. realize right now is um yes, uh you should use it to deal with the unknown unknowns. Let's say you're dealing with a complex problem. Uh a way a teacher or coach helps a student learn is by shedding light towards that unknown unknown. Mm -hmm. And if you ask a question, you ask a problem after spending some time on it, um, and then put that into chat GPT, the insights that you can get are primarily the most valuable ones from my experience using it in the past year or so. It's when it shows you what's, what haven't you considered that are out there basically. And that's breaking a lot of things, conventional things that we currently have in our society, in teacher-student relationships and uh, what would be the role of a teacher moving forward. And... Uh, how would education change as a part of society as we integrate generative AI to our day-to-day -day use cases? Some of uh, this is one thing that, that I just realized talking to, to talking to a uh, older founders getting into generative AI. Some there are people who are older than Google, older than the internet that are alive right now, and uh, that's something that sometimes people tend to forget. Generative AI is very, very young. Mm. And to bring on top of um, using the wrong tool for the wrong purpose, it's, it's part of my main role as a product manager to actually deal with that problem. And as you mentioned, engineers tend to complicate things. And this is more of, uh, we have a term for it, over-engineering solutions. And this is more of not just in a AI case, it's, it's a common feature. Like if, This is how we used to do it and this is how we... Uh, the best way to do it tends to become overcomplicated. And one of the key things that you just mentioned, I just want to address that as well, is that when you use prompt engineering, the reason why no one really knows how to do it properly because people are different. Like if you look at two twins, they're radically different in the way they think, or two siblings, they're radically different in the way they think despite growing into in the same environment. And 
when you talk to an agent, it's similar to talking to a person or an entity. I'm not saying it's sentient or anything, but uh, we sh- the way that we are, the way that it varies end to end is because I have a mental framework. That's a great word that you've said earlier of what I expect the answer to be. Let's say I'm solving a problem and I'm just looking for key ideas, but the other person is looking for a direct and um, direct and a copy pasteable answer. If you take it that literally, we uh, our evaluation of the model varies significantly because we're using it for the different different purposes, despite have asking the same question and getting the same answer. So. Uh, if you think about individuals as individuals and like chat GPT's interface, prompt engineering is basically a way to converse with the model. And uh, if I ask you a question, I don't expect the same answer to come from uh, like a different person. And that's basically our current expectations of it. It's algorithmic bias. Like we don't want, uh, we, it's not even just generative AI. If there's some minor, um, mistakes that the AI made, as you mentioned, they, we tend to focus on that and not on when it's actually uh, useful and it, it would help a lot of people. And I'm very sad about that because it, it pushes people away of AI. Hey, it's unreliable. We can't use it for writing. I'm a professional writer. I try to use it. It's so mechanic. Uh, are you sure you're... There's, receiving- there's three levels to that, by the way, para, before uh-huh. I forget. No? Sure. Uh, one level is when we say reliability, Mm-hmm. Actually, it's connected. There's also a sense of there's no performance metric other than speed. No? Um, and even yung mga benchmarks, but there are these benchmark data sets that you can use to assess the veracity of a model. Yeah. How many yeah. answers does it get right? I don't believe in those benchmarks too much because it's like saying there is a, there's one way to say something. In the language problem, there are many ways to say something. That's why I'm very skeptical of any performance metric. Let me know if you have one that you like. No? <laughs> uh, I'm still searching. That can reliably be used to uh, no, assess the AI. Other than naiintindihan ko ba yung sinasabi niya, you know, if, I, if it says something intelligible, that's not even to say the the truth or the fact content of, uh, yeah, yeah. of the statement is in question. In fact, that's why I'm also skeptical of AI content detectors. No, I... I don't think yeah, I saw your post this morning. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think there's any mathematically sound way so far that I've seen to detect AI content. Only because I I was talking to a mathematician. It's one of the conversations I had recently. Uh see, you know, uh forgot his name, no. Um Kopalkov, no, see Dr. Kopalkov. And he's a, from a sabi, from a mathematical perspective, when you do image for example, image classification, even text classification, what you're looking for are differences in distributions. Right? So if this distribution is a bell curve, this one is a little bit of a power curve, that difference between those two means, yan mm-hmm. ang detect mo. Now, in generative AI, by definition, the produced data follows the exact same distribution as the original data. That's so, the <laughs> right? So it may hallucinate from your perspective because what it's saying is wrong, Pero from a sentence construction, word selection, even the way it's written, it will mimic the original data set. And ang problema, mathematically, you cannot detect truth. Truth is a, I know, is a, it's a value judgment. No, When you say this is a picture of a dog, there's nothing mathematically true or false about that that sentence. We have Unless, to agree what's the definition of a dog. Yes, or somebody yeah. has to actually say, ah, every time we have this picture with these characteristics, it's most likely a dog. Then it becomes an image classification problem. But on the on the surface, the sentence, this is a dog, there's nothing true or false about it. And that's a problem, no? It's a problem for fact-checking. It's also a problem for identifying AI content. Because by definition, yeah, yeah. AI content is a no. Um, is written uh, based on human content. That was, if you yeah. look at these AI detectors, they'll say, oh, this sentence is very robotic. Robotic. <laughs> and it's most likely generated by uh, AI. So if I write a robotic sentence, does that mean I'm writing like AI? It doesn't work, work the other way around, right? So it's borderline scammy in my view. Kaya nga, hence my post earlier. Uh, yeah. Pero yeah. Yun, those are two. No? The performance metric, 
uh, the value judgment of what's reliable. Those are two uh, distinct ano, uh, issues. Now, back to the original issue of what is right or wrong. How do you prompt? Tama ka eh. There's no, there's no syntax to prompting. There are uh, things that introduce frameworks to it that helps people understand it at a generic like uh, at a general level. Oh, no, parang ang, ang point yeah. ko nga, it's it's closer to etiquette. Diba? There's there's yeah, a polite yeah, etiquette and an impolite etiquette, or there's a like what my favorite is what do you say on the first date so you don't <laughs> blow the date? And that can vary, you know. Uh, down right right down to manipulation. You can use uh, language to manipulate people, convince them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, like what I'm doing now, no? If I lower my voice and sound serious, I sound more credible. Then if so, my voice is very high, trying to convince you, diba? Parang, those are all very subtle ways of playing with language. And there's nothing about what language models do that you can... Kumbaga, that measures that. There's nothing na, ano. And especially spoken word versus written word, parang hirap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, what the point I'm trying to make is that's already a reality long before language mm -hmm. models. And then now you have these bunch of people, engineers and all that, sabi mo nga over-engineering. Actually, it's not even over-engineering. It. It's just attempting to engineer it in a, I would say, that, I don't even want to say it that way. Pero parang, maybe it's the wrong way of engineering it. Even the term prompt engineering is sketchy for me. Eh? Parang it makes it sound like it's some sort of a, a programming language. And some people do prompting the way they would do programming then, no? which I feel is a mistake. Um, mm -hmm. diba? Parang parang sa mid-journey to jump to another domain. Some of the earlier mid-journey prompts sound very you know, program-like. Like we have keywords. Old man, has a cane, smiling, summer, background, ganyan. Photograph using a Canon DSLR, 50 millimeter aspect ratio. Na uso yon. Because nga people have this bias na, ah, okay, if I code it up uh, like a code, ah, it will generate that. images. Only to find out later, the best prompts for mid journey are stories. I think you write a story and then the image will come out. No? Some of the best prompts nga are two words lang, but very, very heavy word. Like one of the favorite words I use is maximalist. Maximalist something and then you get you get a really really good photo no um and i list down those keywords but again even the using the usage of keywords is kind of a step in the wrong direction if you ask me parang ayan na naman tayo it's like if and for loops and you know arrays parang we're <laughs> we're used to thinking in terms of those things eh mga abstract structures it's abstract but not in a structured way siguro is i don't know is maybe one way of of describing it and that's why I don't think many rag people know how prompt engineering works. And that's why their rags are collapsing on top of them. No? And these bots are not working the, prop, the proper way. You get these bots to talk, you have to prompt them properly you know, first. And if you can get that right, then you can figure out whether your rag system can approximate those prompting. And the weakest thing paren, is the vector search. Because I think that's the ultimate point of failure. If you're not able to index your data properly uh, in, an, in an intelligent way. Wala. Kaya I'm impressed with the... Ano eh. you, you, have you heard of chat PDF? It's one of the earlier apps that came out. Yeah, yeah. You literally upload the PDF and you can talk to the PDF. So yeah. far, it's one of the most robust RAG implementations I've seen. Pero PDF by PDF siya. Maybe that's the advantage because it's small scale, doesn't doesn't overload. Yeah, it. yeah. Pero if you want to do like multi-scale, big, big RAG implementation... Baka the solution is to have many, many, many of these PDFs and then somehow you're able to upload the right PDF. So maybe the abstraction is you have a structured parang lookup table anyway, pero it's an entire PDF of stuff. Ang tanong lang is, what if it's too big? Ayan na naman tayo with the, with the, te with the context mm -hmm. window problem. Anyway. Oh, sorry, I monopolized the conversation. Sure, okay, back uh, to you. You actually raised a couple of topics I, I want to uh, answer as well. Yeah. Like, Around the detection, mm. you said you said you're skeptical around it. I, I flat up don't believe it, but only for the text. Right so, now, yeah, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. So, uh, for the reasons you've said as well, and yeah, it's very unfortunate because there are people who the way that they're selling it <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. as if it works. <laughs> yeah, there's that, and there's the other side. 
There are people who are victims of this. Na oh, yeah, for sure. There, there are teachers who don't understand it and take this as crude, like whatever the content generation um, tool or algorithm says. And since we're basing this on language, people who talk like how ChatGPT talks suffer from this. <laughs> and that, that's a very unfortunate scenario. Uh, like I, we were the ones that like trained, that the, the model was trained on. And then now since the model imitates it, we're now being suffered yet. specifically around the academic. Uh, we're now suffering from it specifically mm-hmm. around the academic context. Uh, but for the image generation, um, there might be a way forward. I'm not sure uh, we are there yet. But Bing and Microsoft recently released something around this space where you hide something in the metadata or in the pixels or in the mess of data of the image, and that could be like a digital footprint. And that could be a way to actually solve AI fraud for visual applications from, from images to videos. Yeah, like a watermark yeah. of some sort. But that assumes that you were able to watermark the image yeah, before, that be, before be, it was yeah, trained. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And I think moving forward, that's going to be a hard thing. No? Kasi nga, Unless government steps in. Copyright. Yeah, Copyright is already suffering from that problem. Absolutely, uh, yeah, yeah. Parang you, you, it fell into that weird crack where copyright addresses two things. One, it has to be human generated, so you can debate whether a prompted image was human generated or not. But I feel that's medyo mababaw lang, and that'll get sorted soon. Uh, the second is it, the definition of derivative work, diba? So if you have a I don't know. Maybe the painting of the Mona Lisa. Yeah, you do yeah, you yeah. do your own version of it. That's is that derivative of Mona Lisa, and that's it's a direct. If it's a direct copy, hulika, but more of it inspired by gray area. And then now it's run into a model, and then model produces a variation. Is that in fact a derivative work? Question mark. And then go back to the point of you know, uh inter intervention. By training an AI on that image, did that already constitute an infringement of copyright? A lot Kasi, of diba, people... weird, eh, diba? Kasi pag ganun, you say yes. Okay. Does that mean when I look at an image, I've already infringed on a copyright? Titing ko lang siya. Kasi in a way, that's what AI does, eh? By training uh, its, you know, its uh embeddings and parameters and neurons. On an image, it's the equivalent of me looking at an image or you looking at an image. So do I go to jail by looking at your picture? Weird, <laughs> no? So, yeah, yeah. Labo, ba? Kaya I feel that, anyway, conservatively speaking, copyright is a is a structure that needs to change. And then yeah, the, yeah, it, it's due for an update. Oh, medyo, we have to change it. I'm not saying we we ignore it. But if the the purpose is monetization by the original artist to protect their ownership or property of an image, baka yun pa, yun pa yung issue. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to are... go on a tangent here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One, one of the things that I, I've seen like you raised earlier then is when you use specific keywords like maximalist. Um, I used to study, uh, I had an art class back then when I was still a student. And the way we learned art is by learning through how art evolves, like what were the, let's say, themes, ma- like the themes of the era, let's say, like uh, impressionist, abstract, and uh, from Jackson Pollock to Mona Lisa and Van Gogh and the major artists. And what, what's unfortunate about this is to maximize the use of these keywords, the best people who can use the model is those who understand this, the art people. Because they've spent their careers on this, they they uh they study this. But if you if you look at an argument, you see that uh, if you look at the industry right now, who are the most against AI, they're they're also the artists, and they just flat out don't want to use it. The similar thing is happening in writing. It's just more apparent with uh image generation. Yeah, the people who can use it the most are those who spent their careers writing you'll know what's right and what's wrong and what to, uh, how to guide the model to the correct answer or to what you're looking for. And, but there's a huge stigma around it. Like, hey, this is going to replace our job. But that's a complex issue that I can't say it, it won't. Uh, I know the argument that it's going to empower people, but empowering a person to do 
the, the job of 10 people, that means not nine jobs are no longer needed. So there might be a huge reduction. Um, and th that's a major, that's uh, another problem that we need to address as well. And yeah, the, what's interesting is as society evolves and as we spend more time with AI, because I don't think this is going to go away anytime soon. Like, I also feel that <laughs> eh, the crux really is the detection method needs to be more creative. Parang we can't go with the usual um parang parang the way you would normally train a classifier. Here are dogs and here are not dogs. Find the difference. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. I think most AI detectors are now do, doing this uh weird hack where they proactively ask chat GPT and ano na, and uh chatbots answers to certain questions and then they train on that na you know you na nagiging training data nila without realizing that that actually will expose everyone to a lot of false positives diba like the yeah, us yeah. constitution try it no put it in a chat an ai content detector it will say it's 100% ai generated no uh, and even if the statements were read that read as human no so mm -hmm. mangyayari diyan you will be uh ano uh up against ano na naman parang in ano uh judgmental someone has to be the arbiter no someone has the rule na this is you know this is what uh this is what parang i feel the mathematics of it is imperfect pa no of course i haven't been updated on the latest methods pero i mm -hmm. feel that there needs to be another data set other than the actual source text or image Parang yeah. yung sabi mong introducing a watermark. That's like an additional data point. Yeah, yeah. And it, it won't affect the output in any way or form. It's just a metadata or hidden oh, in the in then, then think about it this way. Uh. If the addition of that metadata is what tells you which is fake or not, then you might as well classify the metadata. <laughs> Parang ganun, yeah, eh. yeah. So if, if you have a table of whatever and that, yan pala yung may attributes that decide whether something is true or false, then you can dump the entire text or the original image and then focus on those attributes na lang, assuming you can gather them yeah, yeah. a large enough sample. Diba? So yeah. I feel na it's like circular uh, argumentation. No? Parang, I don't know. It's like looking for the presence of that like footprint. Um, and you might as well detect the footprint. Na lang. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yun, yun, yun natin. Um, There's actually a kind of a middle ground na, you ano, know, ano. just thinking ground, uh, out loud. But this is not a perfect solution either. So, kunyari, back to text. Or kind of images. If yeah. we find that, parang ngayon, um, there's a mid-journey hack I think that's happening now or fix where if you try to swap a face that is uh, a recognizable face from Hollywood or politicians, it blocks it. No? Uh, and that's going to be a problem. Kasi later on, parang mangyayari dyan, uh, what you're actually doing is blocking uh, specific faces na. So you're really targeting people. Yeah, I, yeah. And then it'll be a debate na ba bakit si Tom Cruise hindi ko ma-swap pero si, ano, si The Rock pwede. So Qualifies what makes, like as a person na. Yeah, so what, what makes <laughs> you important enough, di ba? So yeah, yeah. then that that's a mess. And then yeah. in, in a similar manner, uh, we were debating this in the, because I was recently in Taiwan in a journalist conference and the discussion was about how do you detect uh, parang fake news. And then there was a Japanese group that preferred an answer that um, parang fake news daw in their view is strongly associated with right-wing politics. So they did a meta study, kuno -kuno, and they've actually found it na may relationship nga. It's, it's, a, mi it's a mild uh, correlation if you ask me. And then they put that forward. No? Now ako, I objected. So I go, teka, are you saying that if you're not right wing, you're not capable of doing fake news. I don't see the connection. Because what you're doing here now is you're you're attacking an ideology, a, pol a political ideology, uh, and that's dangerous. Because once we say that, then that's the slow, steady decline to censorship. Now, okay, AI will let you pass as long as you talk left wing. Pero pag right wing bawal. That's the dangerous part when. Oh becomes interpreted in the wrong way. Mm. Similar to how, like, eto, mga researchers to, ah, gumawa na study, interpreted, and may, may nagawang data. Yeah. Uh, like, it can be sensationalized out to the, like, 
blown out of proportions the initial scope of the study and be used in wrong applications and whatnot. I think that's what's happening with uh, the contextualized use of generative AI in conversations. Uh, the, the data is being used wrong, when, uh, at least not at its maximum potential. Um, I want to bring back to a point you mentioned earlier about like, um, like the engineers don't get it, like how how it's being used and how it's being how it we could drive value to it outside of like the technical limitations. Yep. I'm I'm looking at it as we need to contextualize the use case here. Like one part is when I was identifying the gaps in the market, specifically around understanding and applying generative AI. I find three major gaps and points that uh, we need to understand, or at least the people need to understand from those groups ab about AI and the recent advancement. So one would be the executives and the leaders of society. Yung, mm -hmm. uh, tipong, there are a lot of scenarios na, hey, palitan na natin yung buong customer service team natin yeah. dahil kaya na ni AI. And now they're facing the problem and looking to hire back the people. I, I don't. By the way, I, I that that was. Yeah. I don't know. I I heard one company did that in India, and yeah, yeah. I don't know if they're doing well now, but I actually don't think that will happen large scale yet. And yes. there's actually evidence in in literature research that indicate that the effect of digitization and automation de depends on the job, talaga. So if it's uh, yeah. something repeatable to a T, parang factory work, there's a high tendency for automation to eliminate the human. Because yeah. if you get a machine that does it, parang ano, and dami mga robotics na applications, talagang you get rid of that the person na. Like I saw just this now, right before we had the talk, there was this machine that, yung, alam mo yung mga lettering sa cakes, happy birthday, yeah, yeah, yeah. Decor may machine na yun ch -ch 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 -ch. wala na dead na yung ano <laughs> dead, na yung ba dead na yung baker or the baker makes the cake but uh, in theory you just need to make a cake from a you know generic pile of whatever dough and then yung mga yeah. lettering na yan it's already done by machine now yeah. if the job naman is even if it's repetitive but it requires some measure of ano, qualitative or judgmental you know thought process the tendency for automation is to actually enrich the job the, the person yes. stays, but you have more capacity to mo do more of your judgmental type work. And actually, I don't know if I'll eat my words later on, most call center work fall in that category. Because people forget. Now, if if try calling any a bank or a telco, even a hotel, for you to get to an agent, you would have gone through this complicated voice response menu already. Right? And that covers 90% of repeatable, predictable. I mean, that's why they implemented the IVRS system. Yeah, okay, yeah. simple inquiry, simple application, press one, press two, press three, press star. For you to get to the agent, either that system was too complicated for you, so it falls into the and everything else bucket. Press zero, you go to the agent. So in a way, there is filtering. So what goes to the agent is really either the out-of-the-box or wrong UX kind of scenario. And that's not necessarily... Yeah, it's not necessarily predictable. There's maybe a range of possible outcomes na, kunyari, in a bank, uh, maybe it's a fee reversal, maybe I lost my card, maybe I want to report suspicious behavior. Meron na yun. Pero at, at the call level, you don't know. You don't know until sumagot yung tao. So the argument, if you watch yung say, kay Super Focus, Stephen Su, is really agent assist, where you have human, pero when in the conversation happening, the AI will be fast enough to listen in and tell the agent, this is probably what you want. One, two, three, four, five. And then the agent doesn't have to rummage through any knowledge base anymore. Click na lang yeah, and yeah. then boom. So I feel that those jobs, those will be the jobs of the near future where it's cybernetic. Hindi, hindi siya Android. It's cyborgs. No? Humans assisted by machines. You're already and, there. Yeah. You're smartphones. Mm -mm. So anyway, that, that, that could be... Anyway, very short lived until we get to some level of super intelligence, and then talaga let's really yeah, worry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I don't, I don't buy the whole uh, humans will be automated out argument. Nakatawa yeah. nga dyan, eh. One of the best examples I encountered was the. Are you familiar with Telstra, the the telco? I've heard so, about it. Yeah, yeah. They're an Australian telco, and one of the the CEO of Telstra nine years ago famously said, "In five years, call centers will not exist." 
kasi nga AI will be there. Well, awan ng Diyos, since that statement, we grew by a million jobs in our BPO sector. So, so much for, ano, so much for call centers not existing. I'm not saying they will exist forever, but the way the technology works now, the way AI, even AI works now, Gen AI especially, seems to indicate augmentation of work. Yun ang, yun ang pakiramdam ko. And that can only be good. You know? And yeah. then now you notice the people saying gloom and doom scenarios are stop are not using AI anymore as the excuse. They're looking at other macro things like, oh, the US economy will go into a recession, political risk, blah, blah, blah. And even they, for me, haven't really read the research. If you look at uh, historical uh, downturns in the US economy, there will be layoffs in the US, but that inadvertently results in more jobs in India, in the Philippines. We actually benefit from that. Like in the last ano alone, last year lang, huh? the BPO sector uh, ended with 1.7 million jobs. Uh, and I think it grew by 150K or 130K in the same period that there were massive tech layoffs in the US. So yun eh, parang counter flow yung economy mo. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't want to oversell it too much, but I feel that startups like us need to pay attention to those macro trends. Eh, or Absolutely. Something. Yeah. I, I give talks around how do you build impactful LLM-powered applications. So like, how do we actually build with AI? And one of my key ideas here, it's, it's a spectrum. Take a look at it as a spectrum. One side, it's the matrix where... All of it is AI. It automates our work, does our work. That's super intelligence and we don't need to work anymore. That's like a doom vision that people sell. On the other side, is pure manual. Think about before technology, like 100 years ago, the yeah. industrial revolution, or even way before that, it's just humans. Um, what succeeds throughout like history, at least the, mo the most recent part, is in the middle where we learn about the tool it gets introduced, it gets hyped up, the expectations go to the peak, and then we realize it's limitation. So it goes down to the throw of the solution mode. Mm. I've talked to founders about this idea stage, uh, founders, and like they had like high expectations of GPT, and that just crushed them. And I said, great, now that we're at the throw of the solution mode, we can now start to make tedious and like painful progress towards productivity. So we know what's capable of and where should we go to in the movie forward. Can you, I know, can you elaborate on that a bit? Because I'm curious then Perfect. how, what were the false approaches or ideas that got them in trouble? Uh, yan yung mga idea stage startups when it came to GPT. Yeah, so uh, it's one of the most common scenarios is what we just discussed. Yung, gusto palitan natin yung buong, ano, yung buong customer service uh, ano natin, uh, team. And with, looking, uh, with a robot. Or with a, yeah, with a, yeah, with a bot. Okay. And I see that that won't work if you care at all about user experience. Like, oh, okay. there, there is a way to make it work. Like, there are a lot of things to be improved. Like, even new system that we, we dial in. I don't, I'm not sure if what it's called. Baka yun yung sinasabi mong IVRS. But uh, yung voice there, it could be a little bit more intelligent, but it's still not at the point of like, replacing the customer service department. Mm. At the same side, you might be able to reduce like the headcount by making them more efficient. So that's the gray area that's still, I'd say, a little bit orange instead of gray. So if total annihilation of like, a job segment is uh, red, like if you can make a segment of the population smarter and more efficient, B uh, BCG, Boston Consulting Group, did a study on this. Um, a very interesting study that uh, I believe people should take a look at. Where generative AI shines is with creative tasks, not business problem solving. So they did a study of this with their consultants and they found very interesting key insights. Like one site, one, one key factor there is that if the workforce uses generative AI, the variance in performance, like from poor performance and high performer, shrinks. So, mas sumataas yung bell curve natin. So, people are in the middle and more to the right. So, mm. just more uh, nakakontrol natin yung variance ng workforce natin. We're also more efficient at it because they're using AI to help them think. And at the same time, in the same study, they found out that um, 
there are people uh I, I, one of the one of the resources I shared, shared earlier it shines at creative product innovation tasks but sucks at problem business problem solving and then they look at people who copied the answer and used it in their work and then people who modified it a bit and in terms of tasks those who modified it a bit made it worse in terms of performance because uh, they're using it the wrong way So going back to the idea earlier, there are three main groups that need to understand AI in different ways. One would be the executives. How do you actually understand executives from corporate to startup founders, understand this innovation, lead teams and build with it and innovate the processes inside of your organization or for other organizations for startups that look at this as a service, something that they could build as a product and sell. They need to understand its limitations and One way or another, they're going to find out. Um, the next part is at the worker stage. So not just, I'm not just talking about like graphic artists and artists and like writers, even people like us, like uh, at me, I'm a product manager. I, I do consulting as well, product management consulting. Uh, I need to understand how to use AI to make me better. I'm just going to use better because it's not just more efficient, but help me go towards the right answer. So in product management, you can say that our job is to get at the right answer and ask the team to build this. Hmm. And it's most commonly done by understanding the problem at its roots. Tapos building a solution around it, testing it slowly and scaling it up. Um, and that that should be like the approach of executives as well. But for the workers or like the the general population, we need to understand its limitations and how we can benefit from it. And I think this is what you've been sharing about prompt engineering. Like, Yeah, actually, ano nga eh, there's a, maybe people might hear of it later on, no? but there's a, yeah. there are like four, it's it's an emerging talent framework that I'm trying to uh, in, 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 inculcate in the VPO industry uh, and hopefully the rest of the industries follow. I call it Bolt, B-U-L-T. No? B-U-L-T. Build, yeah. Builders, users, leaders, trainers. And wow. diba? builders are pretty much anyone who is technical in the AI space. Software developers, data analysts, data scientists, AI engineers. So these are the people you train with the usual you know, technical stuff. AI engineering, basically. How do you build, tweak, train, retrain these models? The vast majority of training out there is a builder training, no? 99%. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The user is, as you said, everyday people uh, in other professions who may not ne- necessarily... Teachers, accountants. Uh, yeah. They don't Engineer. necessarily need to, to know how the models work. Yes. No, well, they need to know how the models work for them, not necessarily how they're built. Yeah, like, yeah. They'll need, yeah, they'll need prompt engineering, but more importantly, they'll need the... Uh, some form of, of process framework yeah, that yeah. incorporates AI in their day-to-day tasks, especially if it's content. Then the leaders, uh, as you said, these are people who will be leading businesses, enterprises, uh, executives, uh, even business owners. They may or may not need to know how these models are, are built. They need to know how they're used. But more importantly, they need to know how products can be built out of them yes. or, or incorporating them into their business. And lead teams, yeah, and like innovation, making them more efficient. So yun, major yeah, design yeah. thinking is there, systems yeah. thinking is there, and all sorts of Security. management stuff. Uh, yeah. Then finally, teachers, although yeah, they are users as well, but we also need to develop trainers for AI. And they may not necessarily be the BUL. No? They may not be the ones actually Uh, you parang they need to be users plus teach other users or they need to be uh, leaders but then train other leaders and we don't ano eh, we don't uh, um, what do you call this we don't we don't we don't train teachers how to train <laughs> we need to train trainers and that's the multiplier effect uh, you know uh, at stake here if we figure it out no? that's actually a great Like a framework then. I have a different acronym for it. Mm-hmm. Asa akin web. Workers, executives, and builders. <laughs> oh, dagdaga mo ng T sa dulo. Workers, yeah. executives, <laughs> builders, and trainers. Web team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kasi ganun eh. Um, I've been, to, I, I've talked to the schools. They are struggling with this. They'd rather ban it 
they'd rather ban it uh, yeah, than, yeah. than use it. Back it, it it's safer kasi to ban it eh, for them. Eh. They yes, and I hate it actually. They, they uh, just I'm they just wanna so. go back to the way things were. Yes, yes, and that's very unfortunate. Hindi <laughs> talaga, wala na talaga. There's no uh, <laughs> there's no going, going back. back. Oh. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I, I say it's unfortunate for the students because I gave a talk sa Butuan recently sa Mindanao and it's a university. Most of the attendees were students. Mm. I, I gave them an idea on how do you build with generative AI, its use cases, where it's strong, where it's not. And uh, it was a bit more technical, but since uh, the audience I found out were more students, I used it as a conceptual study mm. and its educational perspectives. It was very sad because after the talk, um, the students came to me, mapit sila sa akin, and then they, sa- they asked a lot of questions and like, paano pag pinagbabawal sa school because our school doesn't allow it. It's like, that's very sad. Like, my point there is like, ignore it. If mm. may gumagamit sila ng content, ano, argue for it, like fight for it kasi that's unreliable. Give examples yeah. as you've said, like I'm US Congress, that's going to be... You know, I'm going to go on a limb. Ah. I'm going to go on a limb. And by the way, we're at the hour. No? Uh, oh, sayo, yeah. This is not... This, this is not going <laughs> to... We need to save some for the next ano, episode. Yeah, yeah. But I'm going to go on a limb and react to what you said about education. I'm uh-huh. already at a point where I'm ready to say the schools are not the place. I mean, the whole... The whole... Uh, the whole education system has been... I mean, and it predates... The current admin, no? This thing has been ra- accumulating. These flaws have been accumulating. Technical debt nga sa tech sector. Diba? Yeah, yeah. Um, tawag dito, the, they, they've been accumulating for decades, maybe even a century, that for us to, it's a gargantuan effort for us to start undoing all the damage now. It will it will be beyond our lifetimes na siguro. No? It's like going to Mars. <laughs> so I feel that the life hack will be set maybe in parallel. It's a different sector. Like to give you a very concrete example, when we conceptualized Project Sparta, you know, data science, everyone said, no, yeah. it cannot be done. It cannot be done. Not the way you're doing it. And, that, and the biggest resistance was the education sector. You know where we got support? DOST. It became a research project. And they coughed up. Quite, quite, quite a you know, quite an interesting amount of money just to get it to uh, to work. And there was actually a part of Sparta that was supposed to launch a data science uh, bachelor's or master's degree in certain schools. And then last minute, binawin and DOST you know, Why should we bother helping them? That's their job. <laughs> but not sila. Ched will be the one to do that. We'll save our resources to do online training. That was a weird thing because. DOST doesn't necessarily fund education other than yung mga scholarships, diba? Sa Pisay. But they said, if we don't do this, we won't, we'll still have a shortage of data science projects. So they saw it as a research, parang two-step problem. If we introduce skills en masse, maybe people will start using it for, for, for what we want them to use it for. And that's how it started. And then three years, uh, 40,000 scholars later, uh, there were research proposals that came in. I think it was kind of half and half. It wasn't completely successful. But it did not go through the education system. And the result of the three-year program, we had more than 40,000 en- uh, enrollees. No? The target was 30K. Lang. We nearly hit 50. I think we produced more data literate students than all of the statistics and ComSci and, and industrial engineering programs in the entire Philippines combined. No? And I feel that why aren't we doing this, you know, at scale, no? And that that ended now. I think they're on extended life, pero hindi na ako nakikialam. But sayang eh. <laughs> I'm so passionate about this. I just wanna say na um, as someone who went through the same struggles, I see I, I have like a like couple of ideas here, and actually like perspectives on the matter. Like yung mm. first part is uh the. It's it's not broken. It's just outdated, and there the main problems haven't been addressed, like logistics and quality. Yeah. So I wrote a paper about this in the past. Accessible quality, quality education. It's not just accessible education. It's mm. quality education. Yeah, and, exactly. And then why why are we teaching in the first place and like trying to understand the problem again? Why why is this designed this way? One, the internet didn't exist when this was propagated. Two. Um, it's the purpose of education 
rarely is tied to a job opportunity. Sometimes mm. it does, but it gives you a perspective. And that's, uh, I'm not saying it's useless. It, it, uh, one of the same thing, one of the best things in college is it helps you, it helps you give, it gives you an identity and helps you define who you are during that time, who you want to be in the next five to 10 years or even the rest of your life during that yeah. period. Yeah. And there's some use case there. However, if you're going to look at it, if you're going to look at it as this is going to give us jobs and whatnot, you're, I'd say just for the tech industry, uh, not for like the licensed and uh, regulated industries like doctors and engineers, uh, there are better ways out there. Like MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Publishes their classes with yeah, MIT. they open sourced oh, everything, the yeah. you know, and since thousand, like oh, more, more than twenty years now. And as a student of MIT OCW, I love it, and yeah, I am a jo- I'm very sad about it that I s- our institutions should do the same. At the very least, democratize education outside of classrooms and uh, spend more effort on that. There are some initiatives, but as you've yeah. said, the the solution. I I, I just think. I'm just speaking for myself now. Me yeah, yeah. in uh you know uh in my own personal capacity <laughs> given the resources I have and the connections I have which in the grand scheme of things is just a drop in the bucket. I can't I can't do it through that through that uh I know through that route. But maybe you know I mean I don't get naman resistance and blatant resistance from educators they're open to collaborate but it's really systemic parang it's uh, it's like saying it's easier to just throw a thermonuclear bomb and blow up everything and then rebuild it from scratch then try to kind of bend you know little things here and there and try to re-engineer it back you know pakiramdam ko i could be wrong i could be wrong maybe maybe someone like you or someone younger and smarter can find a <laughs> Turnkey solution, fix it all. But uh, wala, I'm, 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 I'm a little skeptical. <laughs> yeah. But doc, uh, ang ganda nung case, yung case na yun. I just want to provide a little bit of context from a product perspective. So, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, it might be easier to like do the thing, o- overhaul it. And mm-hmm. one of the things na bilanggit mo kanina is yung outdated products or outdated solutions, lalo na ngayon may ano, generative AI. And there are many ways that this could happen. And I think the education sector is experiencing the same thing. Like before generative AI to build applications with the same caliber, you need to take for the same from a specific task like sentiment mm. analysis. You need three to six months to get a production grade corporate enterprise level. Oh yeah. For it's sure. just minutes. In any, in any in any application, actually. Yeah, yeah. Ilang sentiment. And the reason for that is iba yung ano, iba yung uh, technology na ginamit, iba yung team, iba yung training nila. Mm. And um the company is not built that way, basically. Yeah. So now we're shifting there due to innovation of generative AI. We're shifting a totally different direction. Mm-hmm. The education sector would uh, is experiencing the same problem. Instead of like regurgitating information, the teachers should now focus on the other tasks that they do and hone it well, like building relationships with the student in a coaching scenario, like yeah. um, even towards. Uh, like borrowing from the concepts from athletes like performance coaches and um, even psychiat- psychologists and psychiatrists to help them perform well in whatever they want to do. So, mm-hmm. And like just guide them to the right and the best information, reliable information as possible. And that might be, uh, I hope, the future forward where teachers, the job of a teacher shifts mm. and we have more one to one. Uh, guidance powered by AI and like supported by teachers all for the welfare of the students and yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. I do hope that could happen in the future and I, I'm still not uh, uh, I, I'm more of an optimist in that way so yeah <laughs> yeah I think I know ultimately naman, we need to be optimistic you know yeah it's the I mean you can't be a founder and not be optimistic <laughs> Parang yung sabi nga nila, it's, uh, it's borderline insanity. Eh. You know, that's how uh, you have to stay through, even if the evidence is to the contrary. Sabi nga ni Elon Musk, e- even if the odds are against you, if it's important enough, you should still do it. You know, and again, uh, that's what keeps it, uh, you know, uh, in a way, it's a weird way of keeping grounded. 
kasi I I don't know how many uh, uh crises you've gone through in your career. I've gone through quite a number. And there were there were always points in my parang journey where the only thing the only thing keeping you going is that belief that this thing will work even if you know you you know hit so many failures already people are jumping or uh, jumping jumping ship and you've heard very direct feedback from people you might otherwise call friends even family i think i think there should be a rule na family i don't know how your family does it but uh in my case and people around me usually the one of the biggest enemies to your success is family you know because what you're trying to do is off the beaten track na, okay why don't you just get a job yeah or why don't you why don't you give this up maybe it's a chaotic dream diba? and especially if it's coming from people close to you or friends who are not doing too badly in their careers but you know that that's not the path eh? so when do you draw that parang that line no and i have met broken founders no um founder who failed and wala na they lost hope one of the most sorry uh you know discussions was uh this guy working in this incubator trying to make sure that i don't reveal it and then he founded a startup that was a promising idea but then he was mentored by people you know in uh in corporate basically in the guise of being accelerated or incubated and syempre my i can only surmise i don't know the details pero i i can surmise that the advice he got was bad advice like fail siya and ang problema pa diyan hawak nung incubator yung pera diba so you know how it works diba you you you, you pass certain milestones you get a tranche release And I felt really bad for this person. So what he did was, he stopped. And he said, I'll work muna, see if I can raise some funds, and then see later if I can you know, reboot. But it was just so heartbreaking for him. So I go, wow, the system broke him. Yun an incubator, sabi ko. <laughs> I said, Of all diba? cases. <laughs> oh, oh. Kaya ako, you know, syempre, all the respect to everyone doing whatever they're doing, I avoid it for now, no? Until I see something real, even VCs, no, I've been approached by several. I don't know. Uh, you, do your values align with my values? And for all we know, I could be wrong. No, I could be out of the loop. No, uh, baka mali naman talaga yung idea ko. That's actually possible. So, anyway, <laughs> maybe it's a monologue for another session that needs to, you <laughs> know, that needs to be discussed. No. Yeah. Yeah. There are a couple more topics that I believe we left on the table and uh, I think they deserve their own segment just to dive deep on them. And yeah, I enjoyed the conversation, Doc. So thanks for... Yeah, I mean, we're over the hour and actually there's no strict <laughs> naman rule. Generally, it's around the hour, but you can see how once parang you nick something and then, you know, it flows. Eh. Yeah, so, yeah. I think this just means we need a take two. <laughs> we, need a, we, need a, we need a second installment. Maybe uh, as your you know as your uh, track evolves, uh, maybe sometime very sure maybe in a couple of months let's do a, a second round. Let's see what, sure yeah. what what has happened. Knowing how this industry is moving very quickly, we need to we need to really talk about what's happening. Yeah, uh, I love to. Uh, looking forward to talk to you again, Doc. Okay, likewise. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks a lot for coming. Thank you.